Welcome to Roots of Faith. I'm Renee Richard, and today we're in the historic district in Carville, Louisiana. This is the site of the former National Leprosy Hospital, and we will be exploring its history, the religious aspect of it, and the people who served here, as well as the life of the patients in this place. It's located on a peninsula in the Mississippi River, isolated, and it's been here since the 1890s. So join us as we learn more about this historic area. I have as my guest today, Elizabeth Sheck Snyder, who is curator of the um, National Hansen's Disease Museum here in Carville. Um, thank you for being on the show today, Elizabeth. Thank you. So you have been here, we were just talking, over 20 years, right? I have. Started out as a volunteer and then became curator. I know that I story. I did, yes. <laughs> Started as a volunteer and, and I'm still here as the curator. Right? That's awesome. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about um, the origins of this particular place, because there's a fabulous history here going back over 100 years. Oh, yes. And when I was preparing for this, it was fascinating when I was reading it about it all started with um, some newspaper articles that kind of popped up in New Orleans. That's and right. There was an expose. There. there was an expose in the 1890-91, um, which uh, proved to New Orleans residents that leprosy was being cared for in their community. Um, in group homes by mm -hmm. doctors who were contracted by the state. So the exposés brought that to the public's attention and the public demanded that uh, there be changes, law was passed, a board of control was formed to find a location for a hospital dedicated for the care and treatment of leprosy. And it was called the Louisiana Leper Home and this was that location. That's it and we are, you know, an hour Mm -hmm. a more drive by car, right. but of course they came by boat because that was the inner state of travel at that time. That's correct. Um, and so when they arrived here, but this was a, a working plantation at one point, at one the point facility it, back in, right. before the Civil War. Before the Civil War, and, and probably after the Civil War, it was um, sharecropped. Right. There, there were the, attempts made to keep it going in the agriculture right. world. Correct, correct. But the plantation building itself, the mansion was abandoned for mm -hmm. several years, and it fallen into ruin, but there were still half a dozen slave quarters uh, standing on the property, and that's where the first patients lived. Right. And that um, was in 1894. Yes, and so they came, and when they br they came, there was just a handful of them that, that came, oh, yeah. correct? Seven patients were the first patients. Uh, they lived in the slave quarters. A uh, doctor would come once a week, like you mentioned. He'd take mm -hmm. a steamer up the river, and uh, overnight in the old plantation, which was in ruins, and give the patients whatever palliative care he had to offer and then go back to New Orleans. So the patients were fending for themselves. It was rough. Right, now they did have the, the sisters here. Not until 1896. So for oh, the so first for the first few half, years or so, they were on their own, correct. pretty much kind of as they were in New Orleans. Correct. Same type of thing, being seen periodically by That's a physician. Right. That's right. Okay, now I understand a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So when they did arrive here, like you said, mm -hmm. um, the elements here with the elements, and then then over time? The Daughters the of Charity sisters. arrived in 1896, and they didn't leave until 2005. So they improved the place immediately. Of course, the first sisters arriving, four sisters, uh, they agreed to provide household management, which included laundry, food, and nursing care for $100 each a year. Wow. Yes. And they moved in when they arrived. They moved they into actually the moved into one, the, like one room of that house because the house was in such ruins. It from was what a I read. terrible shape. There are letters that the sisters wrote to and from uh, New Orleans and then to the headquarters, uh, the mother house in Emmitsburg, Maryland, that are priceless because they're full of details about the mansion was falling apart and mm. full of critters. Right. And right. Um, the sisters were trying to clean it up room by room as they had time. And there were some mishaps, as you can imagine. One sister fell through the joists of the upstairs and was only caught by a beam and dangling there until the other sisters could manage to pull her out. There were encounters with snakes. Yeah. 
all this kind of Rough. stuff. So it started out then kind of as a, what, a local, a local venture out of New Orleans before it was sold to the state in 1906. No, so it was a state. It was a okay, state. Okay, first thing. it was a private property as a plantation, a sugar plantation, mm -hmm. and then the state leased it from that 1894 was it. Until, 19... until 1905. Five. They didn't actually okay. make the per purchase until 1905. It's a, uh, that's a good point for me to explain why, because the state never wanted to remain here. This was called the Louisiana Leper Home. All of the expertise, all of the supplies, all of the the nurses and doctors were in New Orleans. Right. So they were having to truck supply, or not truck, but float them upriver, right. people and supplies upriver, get them to the patients, and then it was just a hardship, and it was difficult to care for them. So the state always had a mind that we'd sneak back and get closer <laughs> to New Orleans, and actually they purchased a property in 1900, 1901, Elkhorn Plantation. It was on the river, on the West Bank, across from where the airport Okay. Yes, in Kenner. Mm -hmm. Well, the people in New Orleans hadn't forgotten, <laughs> and they found out the state had purchased the property and had intentions of turning Elkhorn Plantation into the Louisiana Leper Home, and they burned down the, oh my goodness. the, the property, all that. of it. Yes. So the state gave up at that point and said, let's purchase. We're not going anywhere, obviously. They had to chase down the family who was living in Europe. Oh they goodness. purchased the property and um, then started building permanent structures at that time. That's one Here. reason it was underdeveloped for so long. Okay, and then there was a need from a national level to mm -hmm. bring lepers here because they were all over. They heard about this place. They want to come, but it's state-owned, right? So right. is that the point where they sell it to the U.S. government? Because, again, it changes hands yeah. about 20 years later. 15, 20 well, years later? Well, I'll, I'll give you a couple so, of details okay, why that ahead. happened. So, yes, this was called the Louisiana Leper Home, and people with leprosy diagnosed within the state came here. Now, other states had a case or two that, for example, California is an endemic state. That means mm -hmm. they're native-born cases as well as immigrant cases. Texas, uh, native-born cases in Texas, to name a couple of states. Anyway, they wanted... they There was always... Um, there was always the quarantine areas in any state, especially Correct. that has a right. on the water. But the thinking at th that time, the medical thinking, was that leprosy was highly contagious. We know now that it is not. Right. But the thinking uh, was of got course. hysterical. And um, they wanted to send the leprosy patients they discovered to Louisiana because they didn't want to have to deal with it. And Louisiana had the only quarantine hospital dedicated to leprosy. But, you know, they weren't supporting those patients once they sent them. And Louisiana was running into money problems. Some things never changed. I know. And um, the federal government got involved that way because states, other states started putting pressure on the federal government. Hey, we need a national leprosy hospital. Mm -hmm. Also, a couple, one patient in particular uh, did his own kind of uh, awareness raising by escaping the hospital. His name was John Early. He turned up in... Uh, Washington, D.C. at the Willard Hotel, which was the fanciest the, hotel uh -huh. in town. The elite. And he held a press conference. And he said, guess what? You know, I'm from Louisiana. We have a leprosy home there. But we need a national leprosy home. And, of course, people caught everyone's attention, and it got national press. A lot of things came into play, put pressure on the government. The government passed a National Leprosy Act in 1917, tried to find another location for the hospital because weather-wise, this isn't the best place to be sick with a chronic skin with condition, anything. <laughs> right, with anything, and um, gave up. It was a little bit deferred by the World War I, uh, gave up and, and decided to purchase this property in 1920 from Louisiana, and Louisiana was ready to sell. So they got the 350 acres, whatever buildings were on site, lock, stock, and barrel for about $35,000 dollars. Yeah, so it became the National Leprosy Hospital in 1921. So where we just left off, um, now it becomes a nationally run hospital. How did things change? What, um, how did that impact this facility and the patients in the care here? So the federal government took over in the 1920s. Uh, we had... 90 patients who transferred from the Louisiana Leper Home into okay. the National Leprosarium. It was, a lot of things changed. Uh, I'll try to give you kind of the, 
the structural changes. Okay. U.S. Public Health Service officers came in to administer the hospital, where before that it was run by a board of control out of okay. New Orleans. Good. Federal laws, the federal law uh, stated that the federal government would provide room and board and medical care for anybody diagnosed within the United States if the state had a law on the books quarantining people who were diagnosed with leprosy, which we now call Hansen's mm -hmm. disease. At the time, they probably used the term leprosy uh, yeah, more yes. or less primarily. So what that meant is at the time, I think there were 48 states, 46 of the 48 states had laws on the books Di uh, that if you were diagnosed with leprosy, you needed to go into quarantine. So this became that quarantine hospital, that space. So, of course, our patient load started increasing. Right. And with that, uh, the federal government needed to improve the infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean how many dormitory beds were there, sure. how many infirmary beds were there, the staff to support that, not just nursing and medical, but as this developed into a self-sufficient community, we needed uh, people to run eventually a power plant, uh, laundries. Uh, we had a small farm here. We had chickens and hogs and dairy cattle. Mm -hmm. So we grew in, and the patient load increased. Uh, I don't have numbers at my fingertips, but the federal government rebuilt the hospital in, by 1923 to accommodate 325 patients. And they started accepting patients from all over the country. Okay, yeah. amazing. So the infrastructure increased. At the time, the federal government also started doing research. This, the Louisiana Leper Board did not have the funding to, uh, to, or the expertise to do research like the federal government did. So research started in earnest in the 1920s. Okay, good. Yes, because this was a major research facility. It developed into a major research facility. Over time. Right. But yes, over time. So in the 20s, it, it was fledgling. Uh, we it was had, primarily, the, primarily just caring for them at that point. Of course, and them. exactly. And a lot of that care was palliative care, as in there was no known tr uh, treatment that was going to eliminate uh, the mycobacterium leprae, which is the bacillus that causes the disease. But still, in the 1920s, even though the federal government brought in funding and experts to do the research, the medical uh, profession was still of at least two minds that one half thought this disease is completely hereditary, and the other half thought it's all contagion. Well, it's actually a little bit of Above, both, from what I read, and not right. a lot of either. What they didn't know either, and that we now know, is that Hansen's disease is very feebly contagious. You have to be one of the 5% of people in the world that is susceptible genetically, then you have to have a prolonged exposure from probably another person who has the disease, may or may not know it, but they're um, contagious, and it's upper. The thinking is it's upper respiratory tract. Do they know that for sure? When you say the that's, thinking, well, yeah, is, they can't I think reproduce they that. In, know that. Yeah, yeah. they can't reproduce it in the lab. But that's yes, it's upper respiratory tract droplets. And it was never. They were never able to do it in a laboratory. They ended up using nine banded armadillos in the well, research. Well, we still have laboratory research. There's mm -hmm. a lot they were able to do in the laboratories. One of the searches that the federal government initiated in the 1920s was looking for a research animal, an, an animal that they could infect with mycobacterium leprae. Because to this day, a confounding factor in the research is we can't culture this germ or my bacillus in the laboratory. Right, in a petri dish. That's <laughs> correct. We can't grow it in a test tube, for lack of, you know, a better mm -hmm. way of putting it. And we still can't. So the research started to find an animal that could be infected and then be studied. And they went through all the usual suspects. Even I found a telegram about a shipment of prairie dogs they were expecting in uh -huh. the 1920s. Well, they weren't successful with the prairie dogs, but they eventually were with the nine-banded armadillo. And that research is ongoing. It just moved from Carville to LSU campus. Oh, wow. The buildings that we see here, this structure and the other structures that are on the grounds, are these the ones from the 1920s when they came in and improved things? Actually, no, because they improved and enlarged one more time. What happened is it was a great improvement in the 1920s when the federal government got here. Mm -hmm. They had money to spend. Uh, other states started sending cases of suspected leprosy, 
and um, they developed a laboratory. The Daughters of Charity, their staff increased as well with the patient uptick. And then once again, but they still didn't have a, a, a cure or a viable treatment that they could turn around and, and let patients get back to their, their daily lives. So they enlarged the hospital one more time. And uh, it started in the late 30s. So the last building schedule was 39 to 40. And the buildings you see today, this building included, were built in the, at that point in time, in 1940. This is actually, originally this was the staff dining hall. Uh, I think the patient dining hall is the only building that dates back to the 1920s. Everything else was enlarged. Mm -hmm. And so they, what they, and not just enlarged, but they wanted to make things as fireproof as possible. So as building techniques uh, improved and their patient load started increasing, they rebuilt the hospital into two-story buildings for patient mm -hmm. dormitories. That included the covered walkways uh, that were originally wooden and a feature of the Louisiana leper home. They made those two stories where the dormitories were and screened them and made them plaster and brick as opposed to all wood because they really were concerned about fire. We never had a major fire here, but it could have been devastating. So yes, the hospital was rebuilt again in 1940, and that's what became the Carville Historic District. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then research is continuing. At what point did they find mm -hmm. something that would help them, cure them, mm -hmm. um, stabilize these patients? That's a good question, because that happened actually shortly after the new buildings were here. So we increased the hospital at that point to accommodate 450 patients. Wow. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, it hovered, the population hovered around 400. So they're still looking for a treatment, still viable treatment, still looking for a cure. And that didn't happen until we got a brand new medical officer in charge. His name was Dr. Guy Faget. Now his family's originally from New Orleans. Uh, Dr. Faget uh, was a medical doctor with a specialty in tuberculosis study okay. and research mm -hmm. and treatment. Now, tuberculosis and uh, leprosy under the microscope, I've been told the bacillus that cause both diseases are very, very similar. They're oh, wow. both okay. bacillus, which means they're rod shaped. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. so Dr. Faget, the reason I bring that up is he kept, in, he kept abreast of tuberculosis research and he knew they were trying a new drug called Proman. And he thought, well, they're having some positive results with TB with using this Proman, and maybe, maybe we it should try it with our line. leprosy patients. So he asked for volunteers. Uh, this was in March of 1941. He got 10, 12 volunteers, and they started getting injections, regular injections with Proman. It was all intravenous in the early days. And within six months, people subjectively started feeling better. Oh, wow. And then within the year, they started testing some started testing negative for Mycobacterium leprae. And when I say tested negative, they take punch biopsies of their skin and look for it under the microscope. And if they couldn't find the bacillus, that was a negative test. If they did find the bacillus in that punch, then that was a positive test. And at that point in time, with or without medication, the criteria for release would be 12 consecutive negative monthly tests. Monthly test. Right. So a year. Free and, and clear, year, free and clear, of not finding any that is correct. bacterium. Right, and in that their was system. very difficult. It did happen before we had the drug breakthrough, but it was few and far between. See, because Hansen's disease or leprosy infects people in a spectrum. Some people have a high bacteria count. Some people have a low bacteria count. And historically, some people with a low bacteria count can begin to start testing negative at some point, and actually, kind of self cure. Out of curiosity, when you mentioned this, being a nurse, my background, mm. there's different degrees of reaction to it, deformities caused by it, skin conditions, mm. as it manifests itself. Does that have anything to do with the degree of bacterium within them? Yes, it does. Um, let me I'm back just up. And, yes, you're, you're right to go there because it, it's... Now, most of us understand that leprosy, Hansen's disease, causes blemishes on the skin, but most people... Even some medical, actually I should say most medical people, don't know that leprosy or Hansen's disease infiltrates the peripheral nerves. Mm -hmm. And that uh, causes insensitivity and that causes a variety of problems and conditions that can lead to 
uh, absorption of bones and tissue that look actually like fingers and toes or fall off. Remember, that's a funny myth mm -hmm. about leprosy. It's not true. The tissue is absorbed. So insensitivity, um, peripheral nerve damage, that's no matter what level of infection you have, a high bacteria infection or a low bacteria, you're going to have peripheral nervous system damage. Uh, but sometimes the skin blemishes look a lot worse than a high bacteria count. That's when you see a lot of distortion in the face. Yeah, I was just curious Yeah, in that respect. Mm -hmm. Right, and even though we fast forward to the present, we this breakthrough in the 1940s, research continued and trials continued, and now we have a multi-drug therapy, and we can stop this disease as soon as it's correctly diagnosed. So uh, within 24 hours, people are no longer contagious. Uh, but the peripheral nerve damage is probably permanent. And that leads to further down the line in people's lives, they can continue to suffer deformities because okay. of the peripheral so nerve damage. So persons now, because it's still out there, I mean, it has not we been still eradicated. still diagnose about so 150 to 200 cases a year in the United States. In the United States. Mm -hmm. And they are just treated where they are. They're not. Yes, we have, we've gone to it from a quarantine hospital, which this is the mm -hmm. reason we're sitting here. This was right. the national quarantine hospital for leprosy. Now it's an outpatient clinic treatment. Yeah, so there's no area, no place for them to go. Well, it's we just still treated. have a program hospital, a headquarters in Baton Rouge when we moved from this property mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Right. But yes, there's no longer any quarantine. It's an outpatient treatment model. And you just answered my next question because my question was, how long ago uh, did... Did, the, did it go to be treated at a local level? So you said roughly 20 years ago? Well, it's still a, yes, it's still a federal, it's still a federal program. Right. And, uh, uh, but it, yes, well, so you're right. So what they did is take the clinics and put them where they were finding the majority of cases, which aren't sure. many cases. In a year, 150 cases kind of scattered throughout the United States. So there are, there's a clinic in California, in Texas, uh, in Florida, in, you know, so the locations where they were diagnosing cases, that's where they put the clinics to keep people as close to home as possible, to right. be less disruptive. So here, what happened here? Yeah. So that would be my next question. So you have people now that don't have to be brought here. That's correct. But you have people that have lived here their whole lives. So give me a decade, roughly, like the 50s, the 60s. Whenever, so. um... You, whenever the laws were passed that they no longer had to be brought well, that, here. That's, that's a good point to start on. As a matter of fact, uh, the way the laws were enforced changed before the laws did. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, patients were free to be treated by a community doctor uh, in the 60s and 70s if they could find a doctor in their community willing to okay. follow their case and they were not living with a child under 16. That was the kind of criteria. Uh, so, but not everyone had the resources or the wherewithal or even the desire to do that, and so right. they did come as a patient for okay. a limited amount of time. And then when they were stabilized, they could return to their communities. So the reason I'm going into detail is it wasn't cut and dry. No. Yeah, it took, it took decades, actually, for this to figure out. And meanwhile, on a social level, p patients met and married one another. So sometimes they established, well, they did Their establish communities, yeah. and, and they got jobs through the hospital or, put, or started their own jobs on the hospital grounds, their own little businesses, married a fellow patient who may or may not be free to leave when they were. So it... it it changed uh, the complexity of, of and the length of time people stayed. But we had patients on living on grounds when the hospital moved from this mm -hmm. location. Okay, so that, it, that's my next question. Yes, so the laws changed and it became an outpatient. The l quarantine laws changed in the 70s. But patients still came here and stayed for sometimes mm -hmm. a decade or two. Okay. But that they were free to go by that point in time. But possibly their personal circumstances made them choose to stay. No, we're just running out of time. I know, so I know. My question would be, some were allowed to stay, so when did the last person leave? So what did happened you know? is the hospital, uh, the, the buildings and grounds, it's 350 mm -hmm. acres, 100 buildings. We didn't need a quarantine a community any longer. And by the late 90s, they, there was a, a deal struck with about 140 patients still here, all okay. aging, that... Um, they could remain here if they were ambulatory and stay in the dormitories. The federal government would move their hospitals to Baton Rouge and they could 
come and get care and treatment there, but there would be a, a small nursing crew that stayed here. Uh, patients could move with the hospital to Baton Rouge if they needed nursing okay. care all around the clock or take a stipend and move out of the hospital system. So the last few patients um, left the grounds about five years ago. About five years ago, okay, great. Well, we are out of time. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being my guest today as we learn about Hansen's disease and this facility here in Carville.